Union Station. This became a major hub after the railroad's completion at Promontory Point. People from all over came through this station, as did products made here and elsewhere coming in and out of Utah. It was once said that you can't get anywhere without going through Ogden. But the story began long before that. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ayanna Likens. And I'm Zachary Aedo. Along the journey to Promontory, many people made sacrifices, and not just those who came from different countries to build it. For Native Americans, the railroad's construction marked an end to life as they knew it. Before today's cities and highways, before the pioneers, before French fur trappers, and Europeans. Before Western history, there was one constant, a constant that is largely forgotten today. Where I'm standing is considered holy land by its original inhabitants. You need to acknowledge what took place and what happened to those indigenous people that have lived there. Six years after the Latter-day Saints arrival in Utah, War broke out as Timpanogo Chief Wakara retaliated against smaller trade disputes that had turned violent. The Walker War was only the beginning of the conflict between Latter-day Saint settlers and Shoshone natives. The Mormon pioneers creeping forward and moving northward into the Cache Valley in 1856 pretty much was the death knell. As the gap between two worlds grew smaller, frustration grew larger. The federal judge in Salt Lake issued arrest warrants for Sagwitch, Bear Hunter, and Pocatello, the chiefs. And those arrest warrants found their way up to Camp Douglas. And the colonel up there, Patrick Connor, he got those arrest warrants and he said, I'll go take care of the Indian problem, but I'm not going to arrest anyone. Army volunteers attacked a Shoshone village, killing 246 men, women, and children. This was still six years before the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. In 1865, Ute, Paiute, and Navajo tribes united under Chief Black Hawk's leadership. Black Hawk's war, skirmishes, and battles wouldn't end until 1872 when the Transcontinental Railroad brought more settlers and federal forces to eliminate the Indian threat. It can't be underestimated, the impact of, of settler migration to the interior west. Native Americans were never defeated in combat. Instead, Native Americans were defeated by, by attacks on their subsistence. Perhaps the most well-known example of this was the near extinction of American bison populations through hunting and sport shooting. There were several acts in Congress introduced to try to protect the buffalo herds. But the interests of the railroad won out. And so it became official military policy. It became a military tactic to allow the hunters to overhunt the buffalo. Scorched earth tactics forced tribes to migrate, sometimes while under military pursuit. Kit Carson subdued the Navajos, for example, by burning their cornfields. And as settlers took more and more land, natural resources were more difficult to share. The natives for hundreds of years had lived a hunter-gathering lifestyle, and it was a delicate balance of life when you talk about the natural resources, the natural grasses and seeds that are here in the Cache Valley, the berries and the game and fish. Now you introduce thousands of Mormons here. They're hunting the same deer. Their cattle are eating the grasses and seed. And so now the resources aren't there for both groups of people. Eventually, some tribes chose to work for the institution that had forced massive change toward their way of life. The alternative is to live on the reservation and wait for the government to give you a handout. I applaud the tribes that actually went to work for the railroad. Native Americans are still here, having survived wars, extermination, and attempts to destroy their livelihood. We don't have an extinguishment of Native culture and identity. Native people are, um, 
continuing to, to articulate their identities. Every year, statewide celebrations commemorate the anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad. As you celebrate the beginning of a new era and a new dawn for America, it came at a high cost to a group of people. Forgive and learn and move forward. And if we can do that, then uh, absolutely there's cause for celebration. While we talk about the tragedies against Native Americans, we also need to remember the immigrants who came here to build the railroad. Chinese workers sailed for thousands of miles, and their stories are often untold. But their sacrifices through the last spike were vital. Before there were trains, there was thousands of miles of track, thousands of laborers, and thousands of people. It's about more than just building something. It's about an idea of a country made up of people from everywhere that speak every language, coming together to do something great. They thought they could just hire local working men, but it took them very little time to realize that there wasn't enough labor supply to meet their demands on the wages they figured they had to pay. They found that they weren't super reliable because that they would, if there was something else going on, they would just leave. So they reached out to China to bring over about 10,000 Chinese workers. People thought they were not strong enough or not smart enough to do the labor on the railroad. They worked under groups called the Tongs. They're halfway between a very powerful labor union and the mafia. So they earned the same wage, but they had to pay for their housing and for their food and for their tools. And so ultimately their take-home pay was about two-thirds of the Euro-American. All the money was paid by the railroad to the Tong leaders, not to the individuals. And then there were the working conditions. And frankly, many of the foremen didn't count the Chinese lives as very valuable. The big problem was in the winter, there was so much snow that they were working under the snow at times. There's avalanches and sometimes the snow would just collapse on them. There were a lot of deaths. They would let them weave baskets and let them over cliff faces uh, suspended by ropes and plant their dynamite charges. Have yeah, building the tunnels and, and you know hanging trains on the edge of cliffs and uh, an incredibly difficult labor. Their bodies were exhausted. They are in a lot of pain. We see them turning to their traditional Chinese medicines to help. Because of this, Chinese workers went on strike in 1867. The Central Pacific responded by holding all of their food until they went back to work. First they got pretty hungry, you know, after a while, and so then they went back to work. And then later on, I think they were given something like a $3 a month raise. To add to this, there's not a single Chinese worker that's pictured in the famous champagne photo. We feel really sad about that because, uh, uh, because they've never been recognized. There are certain aspects of how they were treated that are, are not right, not fair, not what we would expect of America. I would hope to think we've made sort of progress over the years and so what we believe in 1869 or what happened to the Chinese that you know we sort of come through that. Although they weren't recognized back then, future generations living today say they are still proud of what they accomplished. He, the railroad worker, was so proud that he actually took some of the money that he made and bought a share of stock in the Central Pacific and they kept that stock certificate in the family uh, and just passed it down. There's a misconception that the Chinese came here for the sole purpose of making money to go back to China. In fact, probably no more than half actually went back to China to live. We are very proud of that at that moment and our uh, ancestor being recognized. Since then, we want more people, more students to know what is going on about the real law. They understood the promise of this nation. And so there's quite a bit of pride in our community and certainly in my family.
The railroad has left a legacy that's lived on for decades. But details of those workers who helped build that legacy have often been lost. Bits of history buried just beneath the dirt are giving us a look into what life looked like alongside the tracks. In about three hours of driving northwest from Salt Lake City, you can get here to Terrace, Utah. What was once alive with sounds of pounding steel and the voices of workers is now a ghost town. It was mainly Chinese and Irish immigrants who lived here while building the railroad, and now we only have their archaeological material as evidence. The one thing that you need to know about archaeology is that people don't lie to their trash dumps. When you take your trash to the curb, it is what you ate, drank, threw away. Uh, there's no bias, there's no diaries written only from one perspective. Like, the stuff you throw out is your story. So archaeologists like Molly Cannon will recover and study the workers' trash to learn more about their life. That's a form of sacredness, that we are giving a voice to people in the past and making sure that that lived experience continues on in our minds today. Archaeology often helps fill in gaps of historical knowledge. It can also be the only way we learn about a person's history without any written records. How about that worker, 20 years old, from Guangdong Province, China, that was living in Box Elder County, Utah for 20 years in a little section camp? We don't have the record. We don't have like the Chinese talking about these Irish guys or the Irish guys talking about the Chinese guys. There's just nothing that we can say. How did that interaction go? How did they communicate? What was that relationship? And so the only thing we have to interpret that are the records they left behind, which in this case is the archaeology. These artifacts and where archaeologists found them has led to many discoveries. Some of the archaeology is starting to indicate that segregation was being played out on the site. The Chinese had a separate part of town. Ceramic bowls originally from China were found in dense clusters in this area, away from the artifacts of the Irish. There wasn't any healthcare system. So I think a lot of these, like liquor, um, you know, your Americans were also partaking of liquor too. Uh, opium was, was a way to, to self-medicate, to relieve the aches and pains and broken bones that, that people were probably um, experiencing on a regular basis. Even with their findings, archaeologists still have their troubles. In the state of Utah, we have a problem. The state museums, those dedicated to preserving all of Utah's stories, have chosen to exclude the historic period. The historic period, which would include the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And when archaeologists dig into the material culture on the surface level, it can be tricky. Looting uh, an unauthorized collection is probably the greatest vain to archaeologists and also the greatest threat to our, our heritage. With its hardships, archaeologists press on. If we don't include everyone's story in the transcontinental narrative, we're doing a disservice to all those people that slaved, bled, and died to build that railroad and then to maintain it. If the general population starts to value those materials, then I like to think that'll take on a life of its own. That will begin to create an imperative to study these materials, to curate these materials. It's a fascinating story and it's, and it's an important story. The United States is a country of immigrants and we need to understand that complicated history of how immigrants from far corners of the world have come and contributed to make the United States what it is today. Archaeology provides you with insight into the past that's hard to get in any other way. I think there are precious few gifts in this world than to be able to see something through somebody else's eyes. While we are now just unearthing the stories of people who worked on the railroad, there's some more history that you might be more familiar with. The railroad kick-started modern farming in Utah. In the 1800s, Utah was just about a thousand miles to the east and a thousand miles to the west from the nation's markets. Until 1869, exporting crops and importing others was difficult and expensive. With the railroad complete, Farmers had a way to import their machinery, export their crops, and also to better their way of life. Before the railroad, crops and goods stayed in Utah. Its completion linked Utah with world markets, advancing its economy, communities, and how food and crops were grown and harvested here. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad is what linked Utah and Utah's agriculture with the rest of the United States. 
Utah's economy became a modern economy because of the railroad. Agriculture became modern agriculture because of the railroad. In 1869, when the railroad came through here, well, it was largely an agricultural state. Brigham Young recognized that for this state to develop, the railroad was going to play an important role in that. Back then, the railroad brought new equipment from the east out west. Some of that new technology helped Utah become the first successful state in the Mountain West to turn beets into sugar. For most of a century, Utah was a primary producer of sugar beets, and therefore sugar. That was probably the climax of all rail shipping in this state. You had the sugar beet industry that was, that was shipping beets to all the receiving and refinery stations across the state. All the railroads, Union Pacific and Denver and Rio Grande, supported the sugar beet industry. And then there were little railroads that sprang up that did nothing but run tracks out into the fields. Old spur lines like this are no longer in use here in Cache County. Farmers used to bring their crops here and then send them by train to Ogden. Ogden is the great consolidation point because all the railroads came together in Ogden. And every railroad had branch lines into every little community. So they could ship their wheat, they could ship their cattle, they could ship their products. But after the 1960s, Union Pacific and other railroad companies began removing those lines. Smaller towns just weren't growing enough crops to warrant a train. Besides this, cane sugar became more popular and pushed beet sugar out of the market. So it's kind of a, a two-edged sword. The completion of the railroad that opened Utah to markets in the east and the west helped agriculture by making it cheaper to import the kind of machinery and equipment that made agriculture more efficient. But at the same time, it created competition from other products for Utah products. And actually, sugar beets is probably the best example of that. Fruit production was still thriving here in Utah. And in 1907, the Pacific Fruit Express was founded along with the creation of refrigerated train cars. The Pacific Fruit Express was a joint venture between the Union Pacific Railroad and the Southern Pacific Railroad. The whole idea was to ship fruit from California to the East Coast. That had problems. How do you keep that fruit fresh in transit? These trains would receive fresh ice to keep that commodity cold. On the trains route east, the conductors would have to stop to re-ice in various locations which included Ogden. They would build these big, large ice houses. They would store the ice uh, in sawdust to keep it cold. And then they would bring it out and put it in these refrigerated cars on top of the fruit. And then the cold air settles, of course, and that kept the fruit cool during transit. Refrigerated transportation has now moved to truck. But one agricultural product still transported by rail to this day is grain. Grain is the one bulk commodity that doesn't spoil. It can be shipped in a car, it can sit on a spur for a while, not have to move without damage to the product. And that's been the change of the last hundred years. Railroads are still very important and Utah has now become an important exporter of agricultural products to the rest of the world. The railroads brought growth. The railroads brought people the railroads brought the inputs needed for a growing state. So without the railroads, would Utah have been what it is? Eventually, perhaps, but not as quickly as it was. Farmers found living in the West to be more profitable upon completion of the railroad, but they weren't the only ones to benefit. Utahns gained access to new technology and new ideas, and that brought a world of growth that excited some and scared others. With modern transportation and modern living, Next station. it's hard to imagine what life looked like 150 years ago. Heritage Park in Salt Lake City gives a glimpse into Utah's early immigrants, who were predominantly members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> 
At the time, the church's leader, Brigham Young, saw tremendous opportunities. A man that only had 11 days of formal schooling, and yet early in the game, he could see the value of a railroad. About 5,000 LDS men filled in jobs during the mid-1800s. They flattened the land to lay down tracks for the trains. So it improved the economy of Utah by having uh, workers that were citizens of Utah and Latter-day Saints that were helping to build the railroad. But with the railroad coming in, a lot of Latter-day Saint leaders were concerned about what would come with the railroad. So lifestyles, prostitution, gambling, these sorts of things that followed railroad workers in those camps. Members' fears weren't unfounded. The Union Station in Ogden was a major junction for the Transcontinental. Just imagine thousands of people walking down 25th Street and bringing along their vices. You can still see that presence today. But the benefits outweighed their concerns. In fact, Brigham Young said when others were saying, you know, the Latter-day Saints are worried about a railroad, that it must be a pretty damn poor religion that can't stand, you know, can't tolerate one railroad. One way members took advantage of how connected they were with the rest of the nation was female empowerment. Early women doctors traveled by railroad to go back east to Michigan and other places to earn medical degrees. They brought those degrees back to Utah and worked in Desert Hospital, training thousands of midwives here. Kitterman says they saved countless lives. So women were using the railroad to gain an education, to advance in professional opportunities in some ways that hadn't been available to them previously. And women also used the railroad as a way to connect with the national suffrage movement. I think that the railroad really affected the women's movement and being able to have influential people work together, that bridge that the tracks brought in order to reach uh, in various locations to stir things up. Utah women gained the right to vote in 1870. They worked together and that work was made more effective by the railroad that connected them, that made it possible for them to travel to these conventions and gather and to share ideas and learn from each other. Utah also boomed culturally. The famous opera singers, actors and actresses that took advantage of the railroad and uh, scheduled uh, concerts and, and productions in Utah. We had a number of people coming in that were quite influential and quite talented in order to bring this uh, greater culture, this uh, refinement to Utah from the East Coast. There's a lesson to be learned today as we celebrate what they did 150 years ago. I think one of the things that's been of value is that it represents both then and now what people working together can do. That advocacy and spirit of leadership and cooperation, I think, is something that we can draw on today. The story of the railroad didn't begin or end with the driving of a golden spike. And it isn't simply a tale of glory or a story of shame. It is a story, like all history, that needs to be told in greater depth if we are to understand where we came from and where we can go from here. I'm Ayanna Likens. And I'm Zachary Idle. Thanks for watching. Thank you.